This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member told by himself in his own fashion on December the 7th of 2010 in Toluca Lake, California. These interviews are being recorded in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and stories of their professional experiences. Many of our members began in what is called the golden age of radio and television, and this is an attempt to preserve as much data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer broadcasters. With me today in uh, Toluca Lake is uh, Kenneth Miller. Ken is on the board of directors of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, and uh, he serves with us. Uh, we meet every couple of months and talk about uh, how the how the uh, organization is going to pro progress. Ken, welcome to our little audio history recording session, and uh, let's start at the very beginning with you, please, and tell us how you came to be, where you were born, a little bit about your, your background. Simple as it is. Thank you very much for having me, Jerry. Uh, this is almost the 100% pioneer uh, person as far as living in Southern California. Actually, we moved out from Chicago at the uh, tender age of four years old when we came out here. I've lived out here through all my periods of education, military experience, and family life. I've been very fortunate to enjoy a beautiful family. My biography includes uh, my wife Marlene, who is my wife of 52, almost said 72. That, oh my gosh, <laughs> that would be something. That would have been, I'd have heard from her on that one. But uh, <clears throat> with my wife Marlene of 52 years, we have four children, grown children, and eight uh, grandchildren. Uh, wonderful, if I may say, and of course my pride uh, runneth over when we talk about them. I uh, went through my formal years of education from grammar school. I have a friend who he and I both attended the same kindergarten class over, over almost over 70 years ago. But uh, going through school out here in uh, lower grades and uh, on to UCLA, and uh, from there, the Korean conflict got started, and uh, with that in full sway, I decided that I would change my activities from UCLA Blue and Gold to Air Force Blue. Uh -huh. so it wasn't there. It wasn't Air Force Blue in those days, though, right? No, it was uh, Air Force Tan. Air Force Tan, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I changed it because it's much more fashionable with blue. But yes. out of the Air Force and uh, an unusual period of my life in, in the Air Force in that, well, Ken, how did you get started in radio? And uh, it really was a, an unusual period of my life because I went uh, t into the Air Force in 1952 and uh, moved up on into a radio operator school, became an airborne radio operator, and uh, spent four years in that capacity, as well as being assigned to the chief radio operator for the world's largest experimental airplane, the XC-99, hmm. which uh, was only one of a kind, and uh, was quite an experience and an educational experience for me. Where was that? That was uh, in uh, Kelly Air Force Base, and I spent a little time in Korea, and uh, aside from the decorations and recognition that I received, I came out of it unscathed <laughs> and uh, went into the manufacturing business for a very brief period of time until I went into the radio business. And I started in radio as a salesperson many, many years ago. Where? And uh, at KABC Radio. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, KGBS Radio. Uh, during my career with uh, KABC and KMPC, as it later turned out, I uh, achieved uh, positions of general management, general sales management, mm. and uh, involved in quite a few activities which to this day I remember with great favor. 
Uh, so you yeah. came, you drank, came directly out of the Air Force and went in, into sales? I came out of the Air Force into the manufacturing business until a friend of mine who was also with a local radio station uh, asked me to think about getting involved in sales uh -huh. in uh, the, uh, uh, with a local radio station, which I think I had mentioned earlier, and that was uh, KABC Radio. Mm -hmm. so what, what was your manufacturing business? Manufacturing was lampshades, lamps and shades. Uh -huh. Belonged to my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law said, it'll, it'll be great for you. You'll do great. Come on out and join me in the lampshade manufacturing business, which I did for a few years. And that was where? That was here in Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, then matriculated into the radio business, which has been a good part of uh, my uh, professional career. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been in the business in many capacities, including uh, being involved in uh, the radio sports marketing. I worked for the Los Angeles Dodgers for a number of years. And uh, later, in the latter stages of my career, I became involved as the director of the Dodgers Radio Network, hmm. which uh, was a great gift Boy, of excitement for me. And uh, you had to be a Dodger fan. That helped yeah. a little bit, too. Now, how, how did that get started? What, was, what were some of your first uh, moves in getting that network going full time? Well, it, it, our, my responsibility was not to take anything for granted. The Dodgers are hard-nosed. Uh, marketing organization as well as a uh, greatly successful This was uh, under the O'Malley franchise. regime. This was under the O'Malley regime mm -hmm. and then uh, Mr. O'Malley sold the franchise and uh, sold it over to Fox and then from Fox the McCourt family bought it and that's where they stand now. I retired mm -hmm. at the age of 78 from uh, the Dodgers radio spectrum Mm -hmm. And uh, in the beginning of uh, January of uh, 19, what do I want to say? 19, no, oh, it's more than that. I, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, Sorry. it sure does. Uh, I spent about 10 or 12 years with the Dodgers organization. And uh, from there, uh, for a number of circumstances, I felt a change was necessary. And here I am. Very happy to be involved with this wonderful organization and uh, probably have missed out or let go uh, mm -hmm. the, a number of things that I would like to say, but I can tell you that it's been a very exciting part of my life, all the things that I've been involved in and certainly now finishing off as a retiree from the Dodgers Radio Network. Mm. How many stations were involved with the Dodgers Radio Network? We had about 30. We had about six Spanish language stations and the rest of them were English and uh, kept us pretty busy. Mm -hmm. uh, again, how, how you were charged with setting up a network. You started obviously with a, a station here in LA and that would have right. been what, KMBC at that time? Well, the flagship station for the uh, Dodgers was KABC. KABC. And from KABC, it rotated into uh, where it is at now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was a, an active, busy life that I led as far as keeping a line, uh, keeping uh, the stations busily involved in supporting the Dodger mm -hmm. radio broadcasts. How would you know in, in which market you wanted to go next to establish a we wanted to there. keep it within an area that uh, was uh, well encompassed in the Dodger marketing area, so where uh -huh. they could sell tickets and sell Dodger merchandise, and that was a, uh, a, a large geographical area. Did and you great, go as far north as San Francisco, for instance? No, we didn't go into San Francisco. That the was Giants. the San Francisco Giants territory. Yeah, I wouldn't think you would invade other major uh, major league areas. Well, the uh, the radio network ranged from uh, Fresno, California, down through the Imperial Valley, and into Las Vegas, into New Mexico, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, we even had a station in uh, the Virgin Islands. You did? Yes, as a matter of fact. How did that happen? Well, uh, it, uh, they, they wanted to be a Dodger radio affiliate. The interesting part about that whole thing is that one of our members, former president, uh, Chuck Southcott, huh? worked at one of our affiliate stations years ago. Huh. And to this day, I kid, keep kidding him that he was an affiliate station of the Dodgers. I'll be there. And uh, they're all a lot of little stories, but they all add up to a lot of interest and excitement. Indeed, indeed. Wow. So KABC was the uh, flagship station for many, many years. Did they change uh, in the recent past? Or are they still, do you know? Sorry, but in, is KABC still the flagship station for the Dodgers? Again, it is the flagship, but it gave it, up its uh, position uh, for another station, and that other station lost the bidding rights, uh -huh. and it came back to KBC. So KABC Radio today is the uh, radio mm. f radio flagship station of the Dodgers Radio Network. Mm -hmm. And Vin Scully is back for his. Uh, what, 88th year? <laughs> <laughs> it would seem that way. Ben will be starting his 60th year, 60th year. as the Dodgers radio and television broadcasters. Wow. And uh, he could be retiring this coming season. After this season, the 2010 season mm -hmm. might be Vinny's last, but uh, he hasn't come out and said exactly when it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But I think after 60 years, the longest tenure of any uh, announcer mm -hmm. in uh, sports radio, Ben Scully. Boy, and what a terrific job he still does. He certainly does, and <laughs> I tell you, one of the great thrills of working with some of the outstanding voices in uh, broadcasting, in radio baseball broadcasting, Ben Scully is by far and away one of the most exciting opportunities I've had just to be around the guy. I'm he sure. is a tremendous person. Yeah, and a very private person, I'm told. He is, indeed. Yeah. I think you probably know an old friend of mine, Stu Nahan. Sure did. Stu was the president of the Southern California Sports Broadcasters, uh -huh. of which I am a member of that, too. Okay. And Stu is a pal and a great sense of humor. Yeah. And if he doesn't know 115 million different people, <laughs> we'll have to start from scratch again, Jerry. I went to his memorial service, as I'm sure you probably did too, yes, and I, I, was, did. I was just amazed at the uh, huge turnout of celebrities, sports people that were there. Yeah. I mean, when I walked down the aisle with, uh, with people uh, <laughs> that I hadn't thought of in years, and here they were right there at the yeah. Stu and I worked together in, in Sacramento. I used to direct him when he was Skipper Stu with Popeye. Is that on, right? <laughs> on Channel 3 no television way. up there. And <laughs> I, I directed a lot of his sports casts and things. Uh, we, were, we used to work out together at Vic Tanny's gym. <laughs> and now we both ended up being w grossly overweight. And the Vic Tanny uh, workouts didn't stick somehow. <laughs> well, you both look great. He's not with us anymore, but you certainly are. And you look great, Sherry. Oh, thank you. We had a, a, a lot of fun talking about our gray hair, <laughs> our white hair. Uh, yeah, he was, he was quite a character. When you were a, a young man growing up in Los Angeles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no thought of ever getting into radio, but were you, you were actively involved in sports. How did that, the, how did that uh, interest Actually, develop? the closest I came to being involved in sports, I was on the freshman water polo team at UCLA. Were you? Baseball was not... Uh, I was a fan, mm -hmm. but I never dreamed that it would be possible that I would be working with baseball team. I started my career working for the uh, California Angels. I was the general manager of KMPC, mm -hmm. and KMPC carried the uh, California Angels, Los Angeles, call them what you want. They were the Anaheim representative of Major League Baseball. And I worked for some very interesting people, including Gene Autry. Mm. And it was there that my matriculation through KMPC, which carried a lot of radio sports, I became more uh, versified or more informed of the, uh, of the, the, the game itself and uh, had the opportunity of working. We were talking today at lunch 
of, uh, with Gene Autry had some wonderful, interesting people and from the uh, sports marketing and sports sales activities that I was involved in, I uh, got to know more and more about the business and then of course managing KMPC for several years, uh, I learned that from the ownership standpoint and from the senior management standpoint, so mm -hmm. it's very helpful. Boy, I guess. Now, you were general manager at KMPC? Yes. Or from what years to what years? Uh, 1978 until 1982. 82. Huh. That's the year I came to this area. Is that right? Yeah. I'd have been out there welcoming you with open <laughs> arms, right? <Jerry. laughs> well, I, I was with Armed Forces Radio and Television. We employed many of your disc jockeys, as you probably know. Uh, Roger Carroll was one of them, and uh, Pete, Pete Smith. <laughs> Worked with all of them. They oh, were yeah. all, uh, as you say, they were air personalities at KMPC. Roger Carroll, I just talked to the other day. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize this. Uh, I used to kid him. He would open his show with, Hi, this is Roger Carroll, and I play records. That's and right. Did you remember that? He, that's how we did it every <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. We had him on Armed Forces Radio five days a week on our show. Yeah, very consummate professional, yeah. Roger Carroll. He really is. And still a, a, a fine guy to, to hear. Well, look, the, uh, the Smothers Brothers Hour, he was the announcer for that. He was indeed. And uh, he did a lot of fabulous things. Plus KBC voiceover booth announcing, uh, KBC TV, something else. Uh, Stan Spiro was a former member of PPB, and obviously you worked with him as well. Stanley was my boss. Stanley, uh, if I learned anything to take out of to take with me in this business, it was working for Stanley L. Spiro, who was the consummate professional uh, uh, manager, programmer and knew his sports and knew everything that he was involved in. Tremendous guy. We, we're going, we miss Stan a lot. Yes, indeed. Yeah, he, he was a wonderful person to have in this organization, Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. Uh, KMPC in those days was probably one of the finest radio stations in America, I would guess. Considered middle of the road, I presume, if, yes. you, if you categorized it. Along with KSFO in San Francisco, they were kind of uh, both co-owned by Gene Autry right. at one time. Right. And the, the sound was there, and, and, and it was a solid presentation. You always knew if you tuned to either one of those two stations that you were going to hear good music, well presented. Jerry, they had it all. And uh, thanks to Stan Spiro and prior to Stan Spiro, Robert O. Reynolds who was one of the original Ironmen who played for uh, the uh, Stanford, uh, at that time the Stanford Indians, who was one of the owners of mm -hmm. KMPC. But Gene Autry owned the station and it had everything. It had air personalities, all of them, with mm -hmm. the Dick Whitting Hills and the Gary Owens and the, and the Roger Carrolls and on and on. Yes. It had uh, a fleet of airplanes and mobile units I even had the opportunity to fly the company airplane and give traffic reports. You did? Yes, I was. Uh, you, kind of, you don't mean really fly it? Yeah, at I, the controls. Yeah, I. It, it was with, with Chuck Street around. I don't want to talk too much about <laughs> my my prowess as a, a pilot, but uh, I flew uh, a few times giving traffic reports mm. because our morning man at that time was Robert W. Morgan and Robert W wanted the manager of the station to give traffic reports. So I got up there and flew around there. But it had all the sports that you can possibly imagine. The yeah. Rams, UCLA Bruins, basketball and football. Yeah. The uh, California Angels. It had everything that there was, plus the legend mm -hmm. of Golden West Broadcasters and Gene Autry. That probably, if I had to look back on some of the more exciting times that I've had, Jerry. That certainly was the leader. I'm sure it would be, yeah. Stan uh, told me that, that Gene Autry didn't get too much involved himself because he didn't know that much really about radio, perhaps, 
but he always had the best people he could find right. to take care of the things that needed to be taken care of. Absolutely. So he knew how to hire folks to do the job. He did, and uh, you're absolutely right in your evaluation, but he had a mind that like a, like a bear trap. He really? was a terrific businessman, and uh, he didn't claim to know all there is to know about radio and the ins and outs of it, mm -hmm. but he knew enough about it, and as you say, he hired the best people. I'd like to think that I was part of that group, but he hired the best people available to do the job. What a wonderful, wonderful period of all of our broadcasting lives. Yes. I just heard on the news coming in today that he did not make it into the Hall of Fame. That's what I heard. By, uh, he, well, I think he only got three votes, which I thought was very strange. Because, my gosh, what he did with the Angels was fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Knowing Gene, I, we all have our favorite stories about mm. Gene. I, said, I suppose the best thing for me to do would be to back off and not tell any of our... Oh, no, please. Our, Let, uh, you remember, <laughs> people listening to this tape are going to want that kind of story. Well, I, just one, one story. The, uh, Dick Whittinghill used to have a, a restaurant in the valley on Ventura Boulevard called Whitting Hills. Mm. And uh, he was bringing his uh, uh, a writer from the Los Angeles Times on a tour of Whitting Hills restaurant. And there was Herb Green, his chief air watch pilot, in the bar, sitting on a bar stool, regaling people with stories about Whitting Hill and about this and that. And all of a sudden, he slipped off the bar stool and landed with a thud, and the Times writer looked, and Woody Hill says, don't worry about that, that's Gene Autry's pilot. <laughs> oh, man, that was probably back in the days when Gene Autry was drinking heavily himself. Gene had been known to take a <laughs> shot or two. In fact, that the only time I ever saw him, I was staying at the Continental Hotel, on the Sunset Strip, which right, he then, was his he then owned. Yeah. And I was down in the bar and having a drink or two, and he was there too, uh, quite, uh, in, I won't say he's inebriated, but he was certainly uh, very uh, actively involved in in the uh, schnapps <laughs> at yeah. that point. Yeah. yeah, he was. What a guy. He was indeed. Great but owner. What would you, uh, you were at UCLA. Yes. And studying what? Business administration. Oh, you took a business? Okay, so that led naturally eventually into sales, I guess. I guess it makes sense. Everyone told me as I grew up in the, in the production and, and the talent end of the business that you really ought to get into sales because that's the place where the money is. But the, the people that I saw in sales and met during my career growing up uh, said it's really hard work. And you really, you really have to get out there and hustle if you're going to make, make, a, make a good living. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of showbiz, a lot of hard work, and it's very competitive. And it's changed. It's even harder now. Mm. And uh, I told people that I, you know, just talking about the radio business in general, sales, yes. that uh, I don't miss it. No. I'm happy. I would like to think I was successful, but then we always look back and say, I know I was successful because my mind tells me that. Yes. But I had a lot of, uh, a lot of happiness and a lot of rewards in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's tough. It's a tough, tough business. You never wanted to get into the, into the talent side of the house? Have any inclinations in that regard? Uh, no. Uh, I... I, I did a little bit. I used to read editorials. Ah. Uh, I, I did editorials. And there were two or three guys in town that competed in. in George Nicola was one. George Nicola, George Green. Oh yeah. And I had a couple of uh, my own editorials that uh, popped in there. But George Nicola was the one who was known for the most yes. about uh, his uh, editorials. But uh, I, I never got into the side of microphone side. Mm -hmm. Aside from, like I say, giving a few traffic reports flying around Los Angeles and doing a few editorials and occasionally sitting in on one of our talk shows. We were talk radio 
toward the end of my tenure. And uh, I, I like getting on the air with our people and talking to the listeners and getting their feedback. But that's it. Who were some of the talk radio hosts at that point? Well, we had a fellow by the name of Hilly Rose. Oh, yeah. And Hilly's living up in Northern California now. And uh, even Roger Carroll tried to become a talk show host. Did he? I'd forgotten that. But, but. Uh, yeah, we changed over mm. from music to talk. And therein lies another story, Jerry. Who, okay, Who's, whose idea was that? Well, the consultant? Usually the consultant had a, a fellow by the name of George Burns was a very famous consultant. Yes. And he had a few things to say. I had a few things to say. Whatever we had to say, I wish I had taken it back where it was originally with the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the talk format didn't work out that well. <laughs> not for us. It did yeah. for other stations, but uh, it, it didn't work out the way we wanted it to. But yeah. that's something that I'll look back on and say, hey, you know, it would have been, it would have been. But uh, it, uh, talk radio is a different, different sport. It is. It is indeed. And even that has changed now from what it was in those days. Oh, absolutely. Totally, totally different. Absolutely. Some people, some people would say it's on its way out and music is coming back. Who knows? I'll leave that up to the more educated, involved, well-informed for, well people mm -hmm. who know much more than I do. That's right. I get to go out and talk to people about what was or could have been. Yeah. That's another story unto itself. What do you like to listen to on the radio these days? Well, obviously, I love listening to baseball mm -hmm. on the radio it's, it, because it's just it's totally involved for me. But I like music. I like talk radio. I like mm -hmm. a lot. I like to spin through the dial and see wow. who's doing what. And uh, radio is very entertaining medium for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, this morning at 1 o'clock, I was yeah. awake listening to KNX talking about what the weather was going to be like today. And you know something, Jerry? They were right. It's raining out It's there. raining out there. <laughs> Although right now I see a little sunshine. Oh, a little sunshine, too. too. Yeah. Oh. Now, radio is something that, you know, when television first came on, they said radio will die, and we won't even remember it in 50 years. Well, oh. it's as strong as ever, but probably not as healthy in many regards as it once was. Uh, but I'll bet Nick will bounce back again. In Armed Forces Radio, we had a had a problem because we had we're trying to be and we we're trying to please all kinds of audience. We had the, the young kids that were in the service, single overseas for the first time. We had the married ki uh, kids, not much older, overseas for the first time with right. their families, right. uh, and many of whom were women who had never stepped outside the, their hometown, let alone their country before. So you had to have something on the radio for them. But we only had one radio station in each of these areas. Multiplicity. So you had to have something for everybody, literally. I, I can remember when I was in Korea, we used to listen to Armed Forces Radio mm -hmm. at the squadron that I was in. And I can remember today the jingle and I, I know I wouldn't be able to complete it, but there it was. We sing the old songs, we sing the new, and maybe we'll sing a song that's just about right for you. On the, that was the uh, that wasn't it totally totally correct, but that was the Armed Forces Radio jingle that we used to listen to in 1951, 52. So. Yeah, well, we we continued with a lot of other jingles <laughs> beyond that too. Uh, it, was it called AFKN in those days, you recall? Armed American Forces Korea Network? I'm not sure it was in, 50, it, in the it 50s. Could have been. It could have uh, been. There were so many changes over there. Um, but we had, you know, when I left, when I retired in 1996, we were in about 400 countries. And, that's and it. it's just amazing how it's grown. But these are not, you know, full-fledged radio stations. They're little... Little receiving sites where people could tune right. in and right. hear us by satellite. But served a purpose. Served a purpose. Served a purpose because they brought home. That's right. Precisely. They brought it home. 
to people like like the, the DJs that you used to have on KMPC, Roger Carroll and, and company, would have to come into our studios and record programs uh, one after the other, three or four weeks ahead of when they were going to go on the air, and not talk about the weather or the time or anything that's happening around the town. Right, right. So, you, you know, that was a real challenge for them because those were the stalwarts of things that they would normally do when they were on the radio right. in their own market. But you, it, you, you're you in another country now, so you're don't, be, country don't be localizing. And, we have, and you have no idea what time of the day or night you might be uh, on the air. Yeah. Because each station had their own uh, program director and uh, he would adjust those schedules to suit his individual audience. So it was a <laughs> real challenge for them. I'll bet. I'll but bet. It was a lot of fun. Now, I'm going to ask you to tell me what was, and I'm, you're probably going to say the Dodgers Network, but is there something else that sticks out in your mind as being a highlight of your of your vast career in, in radio? I think managing KMPC and its involvement in so many different ways, we did so many things Mm -hmm. and I had an opportunity to be involved and uh, it was a challenge and it was exciting and prior to becoming general manager I was the general sales manager for a number of years and I got involved in the tumult that took place in that great radio station as the general sales manager too. I would have to say that probably. However, I would say that the Dodgers were and always will be very special time for me then, as to, as were the Angels. Mm -hmm. So, aside from selling for a couple of radio stations, I think I was fortunate to enjoy the uh, good things that happened while being associated with uh, KMPC mm -hmm. and all the sports. Well, boy, you have a lot to look back on and to be very proud of. It seemed to me. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, it, this, this business is continually changing, and the, day, the things that happened in your time on stations like KMPC may never return, but there will be some th something else that will come along to probably be as good or even, I don't think it will be any better, but at least as good perhaps later on. I, I, would, I would say that in all the fondness of people who remembered mm. KMPC for what it was, either the sports or the airborne traffic reports or the news people in the field. We had a guy by the name of Don Reed. Don Reed had, a, as, as you would call it, a set of pipes. Yeah. That boy, he, he used to go out into the community and dig up crime scenes in his mobile unit. Don Reed, he, he flew with Captain Max Schumacher. They were the first helicopter traffic reports mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Max Schumacher unfortunately was killed in an unfortunate accident mm -hmm. uh, here not uh, a few years back. But uh, there were so many different things that we got involved in. Uh, it, it, I couldn't begin to begin or accept that people remember these. People remember KMPC. They remember old Dick Whitting Hill. Or they remember Gary Owens or they remember this, or they remember UCLA and its basketball successes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I can remember, and I think that's what I enjoyed the most. Fantastic. Have we covered your life at this point? Oh, you perfectly, thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Probably. Can did, you get, uh, did you get uh, everything that? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. We've been talking with uh, Ken Miller, who is uh, just a fabulous gentleman on the board of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters at this time. We've been chatting with him at the Toluca Lake Tennis Club in uh, Toluca Lake, or Burbank, I'm not quite sure where it is, but it's on the ver right next to Warner Brothers Studios. It's then, close. It's close. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been talking on uh, this December 7th, 2009. This is December 7th, a day that will live in infamy, in infamy, said our good President Roosevelt back in 1941 on this date. Right. I, I'll always remember that day, and I'm sure you will, too. I knew exactly what I was doing that day. I was a youngster, but I was old enough to remember. What were you doing? I was coming back from the corner of Wilshire and La Brea with one of my older sisters, 
and mm -hmm. we had gone to the drugstore to pick something up and we were walking back and we got in the house and we were told that Pearl Harbor. So we, there's some mm -hmm. things we don't forget the same That's way right. you giving me the opportunity to pull out some remembrances and some activities that I had mm -hmm. been involved in, some that we never forget. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're helping me do that too. I was eight years old in Spokane, Washington. I had been up uh, three or four blocks above where we lived to look at an overturned car. There had been an accident the night before and the car was still lying on its top. And I thought that was terribly exciting to see a car upside down. But when I came back home, my mother and father told me what had, what had just been on the radio. And of course, I didn't know what that meant yeah. at age eight. It seemed uh, so far away. But my mother's name was Pearl. And, oh, for goodness and sake. And, the wedding, and their wedding anniversary is December 7th. December so from that point on, she always said, uh, besides remembering Pearl Harbor, we should ever all remember Pearl Fry on Isn't December that? 7th. And so will I. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Oh, thanks for uh, talking with us, Ken. Thank uh, you, Jerry. We've uh, been, as I mentioned, talking with Ken Miller. And this is Jerry Fry the audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, thanking you for listening. Thank you.